on the morning of January 17, 1994, it took 20 seconds for the Earth to move, leaving us with $20 billion in damage, 5,000 injuries, and 57 deaths. Were you prepared then? Are you prepared now? If you're not, attend a disaster awareness course. The disaster awareness course will be taught by members of the Los Angeles City Fire Department. It's sponsored by Battalion 18 CERT members and block clubs in Mid-City, West Adams, Jefferson Park, and South Los Angeles, just to name a few. This course will teach you within a three-hour period everything you need to know to safeguard yourself and your family. Contact us here at Newswire LA and we'll tell you more. We'll also tell you how to RSVP for this particular event. And if you find after taking the disaster awareness course that your interest in disaster preparedness is deepened, I recommend you take the next level and join the CERT program. What is CERT? It is the Community Emergency Response Team. And it's a team of people, average citizens like you and me, who are trained by professionals and we know how to activate ourselves in times of emergency. The CERT program is a whole other level and it puts you in a team environment. I guarantee if that's something you're looking for, you should give it a shot. If you want to learn more about CERT, look at the information below on our screen. You can also contact Newswire LA. With that said, let's go right into tonight's Newswire LA broadcast. Hi, I'm Trisha Mitchell with Newswire LA, and tonight we'll be talking to Don Q. Hanna, a Los Angeles-based photographer and musician. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Trisha Mitchell with Newswire LA, and tonight we'll be speaking with Don Q. Hanna. He is a musician, a photographer, an inventor, and he attended the same high school as the First Lady. So without further ado, this is the second half of our two-part interview with Don Q. Hanna. In an old, old career, I worked at this company called Alesis, where I was doing some product design, uh, user interface design, and that sort of thing, uh, and marketing. And I remember when I first started there, it's when I uh, first came out to L.A., so I just did, I didn't want a real job. I just went in there in the uh, quality control, turning knobs, basically, seeing if the stuff worked. And then I remember somebody asking me, um, who knows something about MIDI, Musical Instrument Digital Interface, is what that stands for. And I didn't really, but I was like, I do. Uh, because I knew I could figure it out and I knew I had the aptitude. And that's, that's a little bit of way around be actually being prepared for something for that moment where you can say I do. But at least I had that's enough. That's that risk factor. Yes. I had enough other experiences and knowing that I can learn, knowing that I have aptitude and say I can figure this out. Right. And that's the company where I eventually became a marketing manager and a so-called guru of uh, the recording projects, uh, products that the company made. Which tells us where your simple, as a kid, curiosity took you to. Yeah, right, exactly. Not knowing is the opportunity to find out. Yes. So tell us about Oblivion and working with Tom Cruise. Oh, well, okay. So that's, I wasn't on the set. And that's funny. So that ends up in my 
bio, I guess, just by virtue of the fact that the union that I have to belong to, uh, that's um, the Motion Picture Editors Guild, that guild wanted to interview me as a, uh, a featured member. And one of the standard questions is, so what projects are you working on now? And so we're behind the scenes. We're business to business interaction. I mean, I communicate with the photo editors, maybe a unit publicist uh, of the company. So uh, there's relationship because uh, the still images that come off of the set, some of them uh, pass through me for either retouching. But you're still an intricate part of the process. Intricate uh, of the entire process, yes. Globally speaking, I suppose, yes. There were several projects that were always working on concurrently, lots and lots. And so for this... Be the same with the Fast and the Furious? Yes. So the Editors Guild, you know, just at the time that uh, they wanted to feature me, <laughs> they just, what projects are you working on? And I think in my answer, I said, well, we do a lot all the time, but uh, of note, you know, Oblivion, Fast and Furious, whatever, that sort of thing. But there's absolutely and truly nothing wrong with um, being able to work on those films and not having credit. <laughs> on screen right yeah it's um experience is experience and it's it's still you were a part of that history and it's really amazing so a, a company i was uh, a part of at the very beginning and helped nurture it and help create it or create its workflow uh to be at the point where our clients are universal and sony and fox and lionsgate uh that's quite an accomplishment something we're all really proud of and so it is cool to say hey yeah oblivion and fox and those guys spider-man all those movies yeah they come through us for their stills uh, their approval some of their retouching whatever yeah it's, it's pretty neat all right. now you're i know that you're a member of a non-profit called arpa foundation for film music and art yeah. tell us about that non-profit arpa foundation for film music and art has a film festival and it's not uh, exclusively an Armenian film festival it's an international film festival and I came on uh, to help with the production of that film festival and I'm still an executive committee member of of the ARPA International Film Festival so um, uh, over the years I've helped produce that annual event oh. and when is their next event November uh, the dates exactly escape me so it's somewhere always it's in, in the fall uh september october november and this year is the 16th i've heard this term actually it was quite some years ago i heard this term and i don't know if you've ever heard it um but it's called they refer to them as ghetto artists and it's usually individuals who have great ideas they're awesome and when they actually do work it's amazing but it never really goes anywhere and they refer to them as a ghetto artist and I noticed that in in um, reading your bio you have that duality where that kind of mindset however you get work done tell me how that makes you um, I don't know not so much better but I guess more productive than say the ghetto artist who actually might be sitting on the couch watching this interview and really, really, really wants to get up and make things happen for themselves. Um, you have to get up and make things happen for yourself. Okay, so all that means is a lot of us, and everybody's been guilty of this, even me, people are amazingly talented, amazingly gifted, have something to offer, and they don't go out and offer it. They want the world to just recognize it and see that, you know, come look at me and how talented I am. And it doesn't always work like that. That's the process of success and being creative uh, uh, or successful with your, uh, whatever your creative or business endeavor is. Um, it requires a huge dose of motivation and being proactive. And I think it's just some people don't have that spark necessarily if they're completely devoted to the creative process then it's they're just hoping somebody else is motivated for them so they see how talented they are and then take them under their wing and move with them and, and then they're a success 
sitting there and waiting for somebody to discover you and being rescued. That's, I guess, that's another way to put it. Hmm. That's a good way to put it. You're right. Um, what does success mean to Don Q? Huh. Success means um, personal fulfillment, happiness. It doesn't mean a mansion. It doesn't mean a, an amazing car. It doesn't mean um, superficial um, accomplishments and the things that you gather and, uh, and stuff. I like stuff. <laughs> Don't we all? I, I really do. But um, I told this to somebody the other day. There are there are all emotions that we prefer. We don't we don't necessarily prefer sadness or angst or anger. Uh, we prefer happiness and love, uh, and joy, all of that. So, whatever external motivators bring that feeling, then it's it's all the same. Uh, if, if you're a billionaire and you can do whatever you want and you have an amazing house and an amazing family and uh, that then those external motivators, if that's a catalyst to some feeling of happiness, um, if I have it just by sitting on a bench and watching the sunrise, uh, then it's the exact same feeling. It doesn't matter what got me to it. In the music industry, we tend to label stuff. Because I remember when I was growing up, uh, for example, it was rap music. Then it went from rap music to gangster rap to, or to hip hop, and then the gangster rap. And then we have R&B and then this neo soul. Right. Which I love. I'm just like wondering, you know, all these different titles. And it seems like you really love jazz. What other labels if you will would you say are your favorites there's an expert appreciation of music and therefore maybe it transitions um the more tendency to be myopic about uh, a love of a partic particular kind of music style of music genre of music and probably going to school I was in a very mixed environment, so I was subject to a lot of different influences outside of my neighborhood on the south side of Chicago. I like R&B, I like jazz, uh, I, I like country music a lot. So Okay. So, but here's how that happened, and sort of recently, but it was just representing this manufacturer going down. Um, to the recording studios that were using our gear in Nashville. And so being invited out to, as a colleague to go to the places where the writers gather and perform and the musicians perform. And I had an instant appreciation for the level of musicianship that exists in Nashville. It's outstanding. So the first thing that attracted me was how amazing the musicians are and then I started listening to the music more because of that and gathered an appreciation for uh, country music and so that's how that was born and I so to this day you know there are things that I hear that I'll grab um, and sometimes it's very very pop country like Lady Annabellum uh, that sort of thing, or what Keith Urban might do. You know, really pop culture, country music, and, and maybe not so much Johnny Cash or the old school or traditional. If I'm listening to hip hop, I'm trying to understand the experience of the artists and how skilled, in my estimation, they are at relating that to an audience that may be unfamiliar and how clever they are. Um, in doing that, in that execution. So all of that, as an active listener, not just a passive listener, is what makes me appreciate so many different styles of music. Now, back to the other side of the spectrum, classical music. What is your experience with classical music? Oh, I can't stand classical. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no. Sorry, Beethoven. No, I, no classical's great. It's the same thing. Uh, Amazing, outstanding musicians, execution, you know, uh, what's the, the creative process in executing that, how they relate it, and then an appreciation for that actively. Uh, but beyond that, uh, I guess the, the, 
the ignition point for me was as far back as grammar school at the University of Chicago Lab School. I had this teacher, um, one specifically, um, Mr. Loveway, and my fifth grade teacher, he would take us out to um, Gilbert and Sullivan plays a lot and to opera. So very young, we would go out on field trips to opera, sing La Traviata. We do adaptations in the class. We might take a um, Gilbert and Sullivan song and adapt it to a children's book uh, and do a play using the lyrics and melody from a Gilbert and Sullivan song and then using it like I think we did something for uh, a book called The Phantom Toll Booth. You have an art piece here. Yes. Actually, you have a few art pieces. Yeah, Please tell us what we have here before us. Occasionally, I'll just walk around and see what in inspires me scenically. And this was the result of me walking around Los Angeles, mm -hmm. downtown LA specifically. So there was this area, I was like, okay, old Los Angeles. This was the, the Sixth Street Bridge that I was walking across and I was walking across this bridge, maybe built in the 20s, 30s, something like that. But anyway, um, you know, masonry bridge. And I look over this one side of the bridge and I see these sets of buildings. And I was immediately struck by Mission being across the street from mm. liquor. And I was wow. like, are you kidding me? They feed off of each other. Uh, yin and yang, you know, uh, exemplify yin and yang mm -hmm. and so I took that picture I took a series of pictures but this is the one I like the most all the intersecting lines mm -hmm. uh, connecting the two <laughs> and so and the walls were painted th these colors so I considered everything else after looking at the image a distraction and I just wanted to focus on those colors the yin and yang aspect mission across the street from a liquor store and then remove everything else that might be a distraction and just concentrate on the vivid colors that were there as a part of that scene. Mm -hmm. uh, now later I find out that this was a movie set and I only find out because we were working on this movie at Film Solutions and the movie was called In Time by and it was starring Justin Timberlake and so I was like oh that was a movie set and that's why these things weren't necessarily in the same scene but it got my attention because there's a mission across the street from a liquor store. And so I thought that was cool. I just found out by the nature of my work and us working on this film that when I looked at some of the image from the set photographer, it's like, oh, wow, that's what I was shooting. But the idea behind making it a little bit more than a photograph mm -hmm. was because of the vivid colors they used and that interaction yeah. between mission and liquor yeah. that subliminal message yeah that interaction that uh, if you can call that a synergy one feeding the other I mean that's what yeah you know, I guess yin and yang is uh, uh, mm -hmm. opposite but uh, engaged intertwined you know right. whatever and mm -hmm. that's what's represented there wow. so that that was fascinating to me and it was it's cool that it was temporary and just a movie set I was like okay People don't really put a mission across the street from a liquor store. Right, right. <laughs> and here your second piece we have. This is... Very colorful. Yeah, this is, and that's what attracted me to it. So these are guitar pedals. And um, from a boutique manufacturer. And I found these at the NAMM show, N-A-M-M, -M, National Association of Music Merchants. So my incarnation as a uh, product guy, I would go to this show annually. And I still go because I have a lot of friends that still work in that industry. And so I go there with my camera now. Mm -hmm. And it's the perfect situation where all of this stuff is staged. And I would never get the opportunity to take images of these things collected, like a row of trombones or mouthpieces or drum sets, or in this case, a boutique small manufacturer of guitar pedals. So at that show, I'm looking and always looking around to take uh, really interesting images and that's what this is and uh, so I was just concentrating 
on making those colors vivid. And I have a lot of images of the instruments from that I, that I spot at the NAM show and a whole series of images like that. That's as part of my, I think, yeah, I've got a lot posted on my Facebook uh, photography page, Don Quiano Photography on Facebook. Um, and so that's what this is. Yeah, Vivid, Unique. I don't even know if the manufacturer is still in existence. I don't even see a brand name anywhere. But uh, yeah, I've taken a lot of fun images like this of musical instruments and, and gadgets. Uh, yeah, that's... And so outside of music, photography, and film, what is Don Q's favorite pastime? <laughs> it's always developing and always changing. Uh, so here's what's most recent, because uh, I always have to find myself finding out uh, something new and different and interesting. And, uh, and for a couple of months now, it's been ice cream making. What's your favorite flavor to make? I'm making it and eat. <laughs> I'm making it's it's different every time because I'm so I get into the minutia, the chemistry of it, which is my nature. Uh, so first, it's like, ooh, people don't really make ice cream at home. You know, they make dinners and spaghetti and maybe cook up a steak and a and bake a cake, but who makes ice cream? So I said, ooh, I want to figure that out, and then. Um, I make vanilla and it, it turns out pretty good. And it's like, okay, it's uh, getting a little hard. Why does ice cream get so hard? Okay, there's something called overrun in the industry and that's the amount of air in there. And then the freezing point, and if there's not a lot of air, it freezes easily. How do I lower the freezing point to make the ice cream stay creamier? And what's making it creamy and what uh, different things can I put in uh, there for a final flavor to give it either savory or sweet or tangy or sour or umami or whatever and so I'm looking at all this and it's so it's fun for me from a geek point of view. So if there's anything you would like to tell the young artists that are out there that actually might be watching this interview right now what would you say to them about um Everything from being a musician, you know, multi, being a, a multi-talented individual like you are yourself as, uh, with photography as well as, as um, music. What would you tell them? If you think you can, don't let people tell you you can't. Because the world really wants to see, uh, see you fail and here's all I mean by that if somebody considers themselves failing at something they want the company of somebody else failing at it too misery loves company yeah. so it's like I didn't make it and I tried and I had effort so um, you know I don't you know just subconsciously you know you're gonna fail too or like this isn't this isn't good enough. Um, and very, a very secure person can say, wow, you had it and I didn't. Didn't. That's amazing. Go for it. But, or and just people just are unable because of their purview to understand the uniqueness and the, how exceptional something may be. And if you know it's exceptional, uh, it doesn't matter how many people tell you that it isn't. Uh, if somebody says you can't and you think you can, then do. Thank you, Don Q. It was a pleasure. And now, a Newswire LA Extra. As always on our adventures, Chin and I always find an old fire station. And right here, we're in front of old fire station number 27 in Hollywood, on Coenga. This is old 27. This is now the LAFD Historical Society and Museum. This is a grand old station, opened in the early 1930s wonderful work on this building and thankfully it is still standing. It went out of service in 1992 and opened up next door as new fire station number 27 which we'll see in just a few moments but let's take a look at this old building. It's a wonderful old fire station at one point one of the biggest fire stations west of the Mississippi. A lot of apparatus were stored in there. Huge huge dorm room. A lot of neat places to hide in that building. I've been in there many times and believe me, it's worth coming to. The museum is open here on Saturdays. Come on by between 10 and 3. It's a great look at the history, not just of LA, but of the fire department, 
of Hollywood. A lot of great stuff in there. Now right behind Station 27 is LAPD's Hollywood Division. Now that's not the original Hollywood Division building. That's one of the buildings that went up in the 70s where the old pretty much had the same look and design. Now the original Station 27 and the LAPD Hollywood Division, they had the same type of brickwork. They were like sister stations. A lot of the city stations for police and fire were almost identical when it came to their brickwork. Old Hollywood Division looked pretty much like Station 27 when it came to its design and its layout and the brickwork. They were right next to each other. People would get them mixed up all the time. They basically shared the same backyard, and they still do nowadays. New Hollywood Division and New 27s, they'll share the same parking area pretty much because they're right next to each other. But Old Hollywood Division, my uncle worked there in the old building, and I miss the old building. And I remember it went away. If you look at a lot of old TV shows, Rockford Files, you see it come up all the time because Jim A. always came here to bail somebody out, primarily Angel, who was always getting in trouble on Rockford Files. But you see the old Hollywood division in that show quite a bit. And once in a while on Adam 12, but not really as much. But again, old Hollywood division looked just like Station 27. Now, if you live in the South Bay area, there is a satellite fire museum at Old Fire Station number 36, which is over across from Fireboat 2. It's in the San Pedro City Hall building. That's a great fire museum too. It's a smaller version, but also it's a great museum to come look. But here, Station 27, the original 27s, is still standing. It's a great museum, come by and check it out. And again, as I mentioned, when this one went out of service, new Station 27 opened right next door, right over here. It's a similar type of look to it. They wanted to try to keep it looking the same, but Obviously, we prefer the old station. The new station, obviously, modern amenities, better air conditioning, uh, wellness room properly built. And obviously, with female firefighters, now you have to worry about dormitory situations and showers and locker rooms and all that. Those were all built into this newer station. Most of the guys will tell you they would have preferred the old station because I know with the newer station, there were automatically problems where the ladder truck did not fit into the apparatus bay. In addition, the handball court had a very large crack on it after the first couple of weeks of opening. So, old 27 still stands. It survived many earthquakes. As you can see, it looks pretty good. It's a great place to come. The LAFD Historical Society, this is the LA Fire Museum right here. Pretty much the heart of Hollywood, just off of Sunset on Coenga in Hollywood. That's it for us here at Newswire LA. I'd like to thank Don Q for that amazing interview. And for everything Newswire LA, look us up on Facebook and Twitter at Newswire LA. Thank you.